Let's open our Bibles together to the uh, book of Job. We're in chapter 26 tonight. Job chapter 26. I'm looking forward to uh, celebrating Easter this year. You, you know, last year we didn't have the opportunity to gather as a church family, but we will this time. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be a blessing. Yeah, amen. We'll have our Good Friday services. And it's really, it's really not that far from now when you think about it. It's a couple of weeks or so, a little over two weeks, and, and we'll be gathering together. And so um, we'll have our Easter Sunday services. Uh, we'll be at uh, 8.30 and, in, and then at 11. We're going to have a change that day because we anticipate uh, more time in worship and praise. And so uh, I, I was speaking to uh, Jared before we began uh, our service tonight, and he was showing me the, the list of songs that we'll be uh, celebrating on, on Easter, and I'm already looking forward to that. It's going to be great. And so just reminding you that our services are coming up pretty soon. We do have a, a Monday night young adult study, and we do have a Tuesday morning uh, men's study. And uh, I'd invite you to those studies also. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. And uh, anyway, that'd be a blessing. One other thing, as I have mentioned this to you, I put it on um, my Facebook page and other pages. But we are looking to um, go to Israel uh, next year. And uh, we're looking at prices and trying to firm those things up and dates as well as, you know, those, those things are related. And there are quite a number of people that, that have wanted to go, and, and I, I believe that uh, Israel will be open for us to be able to uh, begin to travel and, and see the nation once again in, uh, in March of uh, 2022. And so just letting you know, the price has been quoted to me uh, for everything uh, at 4300 but I'm, I'm uh, per person, I'm, I'm trying to negotiate a, a lesser amount than that. But if you're wanting to go to Israel, you can bank on that probably being close to what we're going to end up paying. So we'll be having an online interest service, uh, rather interest signups, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to going once again. With that said, here we are in um, Job chapter 26. There's only 14 verses, so it's only going to take two hours for me to go through this with you. Actually, um, I, I, may, I may end early today. I, I hope to. I actually plan on doing that. But then again, you know, you never know. And also, uh, I should say hello to the, those who are online right now. We have quite a number of you watching us online. And I'm blessed that we're able to offer you services online. And that so many of you are, are watching uh, even right now. What a blessing it is to be able to do this. And I'm thankful for you guys who actually came and, uh, you know, for a live service. Bless the Lord. It's good to have you with us today. Here we are, chapter 26. I'll begin reading at uh, verse 1. And uh, I'll read to verse 5, and we'll get into our study. Job, chapter 26, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5. But Job answered and said, how have you helped him who is without power? How have you saved the arm that has no strength? How have you counseled one who has no wisdom? And how have you declared sound advice to many? To whom have you uttered words? Whose spirit came from you? The dead tremble, those under the waters and those inhabiting them. I'll read verse 6 too. Sheol is naked before him, and destruction has no covering. Now, as we begin chapter 26, let me refresh your memory a bit. Uh, one of Job's friends, a man by the name of Bildad, you see that in chapter 25, verse 1, Bildad had just responded to what he considers to be Job's continuous complaint. And as a result of that, we have seen that Bildad basically was rebuking him. In essence, Bildad is saying to him that, Job, you're, you're a sinner and you're in need of humility. He pointed out that God is king 
that he's terrible in might. And he said that people should make peace with him. And, and he makes peace possible because no one can resist him. His angelic army is without number. His sun shines over the entire earth. And since man is not righteous before God and all sin, he said, Job, you need to repent. You're simply a sinner. You have no right to question what has happened to you. And much of this may be true. But how has this brought comfort to Job? What has been said that is new? What has he said that is fresh? Something that Job wasn't familiar with. You see, Job has heard this kind of argument already. He's heard many such things before. So what is being said to him and all of this that's being said, especially the last uh, few verses that he had heard where Bildad the Shuite was speaking, well, that didn't help him. He'd heard these arguments. He's heard much of what has been said. It isn't helpful at all. We saw in the book of Job in chapter 16, verse, verse 2, how he said, I, I've heard many such things. And then he went on to say, miserable comforters are you all. So Job is now responding once again. And, and basically, he begins with a series of questions. And he says, how have you helped him who is without power? So as he begins, he's making it very clear that he, he's tired and he's wounded. How has what you have just said to me been of any help to me? As we, we read the book of Job, he's endured much pain and much sorrow for several months. It isn't something that took place in a week or three weeks, a month. It's several months. Remember back in chapter 3, verse 3, he said, I have been allotted months of futility and wearisome nights have been appointed to me. So we don't know the exact amount of time he's been suffering, but he says, I've had months of it. Now, some of us would go through something, a trial or pain and affliction, and it may last a week or two weeks, and, and we, we're about to give up. You know, we're saying, God, just kill me. I'm tired of this. But Job has been going through suffering that is not, not ending for several months, and he pointed that out. I've been allotted months of futility. Wearisome nights have been appointed to me. This is something that hasn't gone away. This is something that is remaining with me. This is something that's affecting me. It's constant. I close my eyes at night. I sleep in pain. I awake and I'm still in pain. I've still lost everything. And, and what are you saying to me that's going to help me? You see, in the midst of this pain and this suffering, he's saying, how have you brought comfort to me? You're speaking to me about the power and holiness of God. But how has that been something that would bring me comfort at this time? What effect did you think your comments would have? You see, the terror of God's wrath is hardly the right thing to bring comfort to someone who's in pain. I mean, imagine that. You go to the hospital, you try to minister to somebody, and the first thing you say to them when they open their eyes, they say, you know, God wants to kill you. I mean, think about that for a moment. That reminded me of something. This isn't in my notes. I had an assistant here. His name was Tony. Tony used to lead worship in our church. And he also did hospital visitations. And so we sent him on a hospital visitation. One of the members of our fellowship was in the hospital in need of someone to come and minister. And so we sent Tony. And so Tony went and prayed with her and ministered to her and all. And then he came back and spoke to me. And he said, this was really odd. He said, I had the weirdest experience today. And I said, well, what happened? He said, well, I went into the room and, and she, had, uh, she had an oxygen mask on and she had oxygen that was being supplied for her. He says, and, and I asked, is it possible? Would you like me to pray? And she said, please. He said, and he said I, I began to pray for her. And he said, and as I was praying for her, she began to, to breathe with great difficulty. And she even was clawing at her mask and trying to pull it off. He said, and it, it left me in shock. And he said, I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm going to see her die. I'm going to see her die. She's dying in front of me. He said, I got really agitated. And then I looked down and I saw I was standing on the oxygen tube. <laughs> so anyway, his name is Tony. <laughs> and never ask him to come and pray for you. So how would you feel 
And if, if you're ministering to somebody and trying to bring them comfort, do you, do you speak to them and say, you know, you're bad but, and you're hurting, but you, you, really, you really should be hurting more. I mean, you know, look at, look at how he had spoken in chapter 25, verse 6. He speaks of man. He's a maggot. He's a son of man. He's a worm. And, and me, I'd say, well, you know, bless the Lord. That is, that is so encouraging. No, he, 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 is, he is saying the wrong kind of things. You see, even if God was angry at Job, we need to remember that God is loving, he's merciful, he's gracious. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 12, verse 1, it reads, You will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for although you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. And so instead of bringing these words of judgment as Bildad did, Job is upset. Why are you saying these things to me? In what way do you think you are comforting me? Verse 2 again, how have you helped him who's without power? How have you brought comfort to the one who is suffering? How is it? How have you strengthened my weakened life? How have you helped the one who's powerless to help himself? So Job is saying, you should have brought words of encouragement. You should have brought words of comfort. You should have brought words of hope. You should have brought words that would strengthen. You should have brought words of compassion. You should have brought words that were wise to help me to see. But instead, you're telling me that man is a worm, that we're maggots, and God is mighty, and he has mighty armies. These are things I already know. You are a miserable comforter. You've accused me. You've accused me of sin. And your words, instead of strengthening me, have actually weakened me. You didn't bring comfort in my suffering. <laughs> what you've done is you've added to the pain I'm already enduring. Proverbs 16, verses 23 and 24 says, The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds learning to his lips. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul, health to the bones. Why didn't you bring words that were comforting and encouraging? Why is it that you treated me the way that you did? Again, verse 2, how have you helped him who is without power? He's speaking of himself. And then he goes on to say, how have you saved the arm that has no strength? Have you, have you given me strength? Have you given strength to my withered arms? You see, I'm helpless. I can't save myself. But Bildad, you, you have done nothing to give me aid. He goes on in verse 3 and he says, How have you counseled one who has no wisdom? How have you declared sound advice to many what, what counsel have you given me that benefits me, seeing you consider me unwise? Now, Job has already made it clear that he already knows what they've been saying. He said in chapter 12, verse 3, I have understanding as well as you. I'm not inferior to you. Indeed, who does not know such things as these? You're, you're giving me information and, and counsel that, that I already know. You're not giving me anything with insight. Well, you're convinced that I have no wisdom. But what wisdom have you offered? He says in verse 3 again, how, how have you declared sound advice to many? What have you said that is so insightful that every person should hear this? What have you said that would bless other people? So he's saying that Bildad's words are common knowledge. There's no wisdom. There's no depth. There's no insight. And he's actually saying, you know, to be honest with you, you think too highly of yourself. You think too highly of yourself. We're supposed to, as believers, be very aware of the fact that we can consider ourselves more than we actually are. And one of the keys, if you're ever going to give any advice or counsel or encouragement to somebody, one of the keys is always to remember that the advice you give to others should 
be advice you yourself partake in. You never give to somebody something that you don't do yourself. Every Bible study that every genuine Bible teacher teaches first has to filter through his own heart before he pours it out to other people. It has to be something like a mirror that he looks at himself and sees himself because when you look at yourself in the mirror of the word, it produces humility. But if you don't look at yourself in the mirror of the word, then you can take it upon yourself to be an expert in life and you're going to counsel everybody with all of this great information, but you have no compassion, sympathy, or experience. And that shows after a while. And so he's saying this, you're thinking too highly of yourself. Again, remember in chapter 12 of, of Job in verse 2, he had said, no doubt you are the people. Wisdom will die with you. He's already spoken to them and has already said, you guys are very haughty in the way that you're approaching and you're very arrogant in the way that you're giving counsel. In verse 4, he says, To whom have you uttered words? Whose spirit came from you? So to whom have you uttered words? Who are you speaking to anyway? Surely you're not speaking to me. And one more thing, let me ask you this. Who prompted you to speak to me in this way? Where do you get off speaking to me in the way that you are? Why are you speaking to me like this? What makes you think that I'm just going to listen to you because you choose to speak to me? What makes you think that what you have to say is worthy of my listening to and applying? And so he's basically rebuking these people, Bill Dad at this point, because they've come to him with arrogance, without humility, without compassion, without love, and really without anything that would help him to get better. And so he goes on and he says in verse 5, the dead tremble, those under the waters and those inhabiting them. Sheol is naked before him and destruction has no covering. When he says the dead tremble, it speaks of those who are dead and are awaiting judgment. That's why they would tremble. So that's intended to communicate that he understands that God's dominion is universal. Because earlier in verse 2 of chapter uh, 25, Bildad had said, dominion and fear belong to him. He makes peace in his high places. So earlier he had spoken of God's dominion in what is called high places. Job is saying, well, he is not just having dominion in high places. God has dominion everywhere. When he speaks in verse 6 and he says, Sheol is naked before him and destruction has no covering, he's saying hell itself isn't hidden from his sight and nothing can conceal it from his view. One of the most uh, beautiful portions of Scripture, if you take notes, you might want to mark this one, Psalm 139, verses 7 and 8. The question is asked, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens... You are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. I can't escape your presence. There's no place in this universe that I could get away from you. You're everywhere and you see all things. And that should give us comfort. So when he says in verse 6, Sheol is naked before him, destruction has no covering. Sheol is another way of speaking of a waiting place that in the New Testament is called hell, rather Hades. And it's a waiting place of those who have died. And so he's saying hell itself is not hidden from his sight. Nothing can conceal it from his view. In Hebrews 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. He says everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. There's nothing that I can do that God doesn't see. Now, that shouldn't cause me fear unless I'm doing something wrong, you know, I, when I was a young believer, I used to think I could kind of hide or shield myself from the view of God. I thought that I could do that. I thought that if I just kind of hide it with a, a holy smile or whatever, and then I discovered as I grew in the Lord and started reading the scripture that he knows the words before they're formed on my mouth. He knows them all together. God knows everything. So what am I trying to hide from him? And there's nothing you can hide from the Lord. God sees it all. Everything is open. Everything is naked before him. He sees it all. There's nothing that you can do. 
And it has always reminded me of my children, my children who tried to hide things from me, tried to hide. You know, the, you know my son David comes home one day, and he was two years old. And uh, he come, well, he is actually at a friend of ours' house. He, my friend had a little boy his age. And so they were playing, and, and I, I, I carry David into his room. You know, he's two, and I'm putting him in bed. And he's got these, uh, these onesies, you know, those with the little feet and everything. He still wears them, but he had these, these pajamas on. And, and his right foot was longer than his left. And his, I'm looking at his foot's kind of, I thought, what is that? And so I, I opened up the pajamas and put my hand down there and shook. And it was a little matchbox car. Some of you remember those, the little cars the kids used to like. He had stolen it from his friend Adam. I couldn't believe it. He was like his mother. It bothered me because Marie stole my heart. Anyway, <laughs> I got so upset. I thought, oh, my God, I'm raising a thief. And so I called Dan and Debbie. I called them up. Dan was my first assistant. And I called Deb and Debbie, and we call her Deb. And I called Deb and I said, Deb, I'm so sorry. My son David stole one of Adam's matchbox cards. I'm so sorry. And she laughs. She says, don't worry, I've got many of David's over here. <laughs> Adam's been stealing David's cars all along. A little Dave thought that he could hide things from me. He thought that he could do something and, and hide it. And, and he, he did that more than once when he, he climbed into the, into the freezer, refrigerator, opened the, and, and, and found the ice cream. And, and I, I went in, I opened up the refrigerator, and I saw that the ice cream that we had Bought the, that the, the, the box had been opened. And obviously, you know, I looked to see if Marie had, but no, she hadn't. So I thought, hmm, somebody has been eating the ice cream. So I said, David, and we call him Little David, Little David, and it's quiet. So I go walking around. I still, David, where are you? He was hiding behind the couch. And I, he had ice cream on his mouth. And I walked up to him and I said, son, how stupid I was, I asked this question. Have you been eating the ice cream? No, no, you, no, I haven't, you know. We try to do that to the Lord. We hide from God. We think that we can shield our activities from him. He doesn't see. No, everything is open and naked before him. He sees it all. And there's nothing you do, by the way, that he hasn't already been aware that you would do. He, he knew what I would do. He knew what you would do when he saved you. He knew what you would do with the gospel, and still he trusted you with it. He knew that there would be times that we are unfaithful to him, and he still called us. Why? Because he sees not just what we've done, but what we will be. And God has a way of working us through that to make us in the image of Jesus Christ. And so he works with us in that way. He sees it all, and he saw it all and yet he loves you. And so he's speaking concerning this, and he says, God sees everything. And he continues, and he says in verse 7, he stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. Interestingly, one of my commentators said that he is accurately describing the condition of the earth, how it is suspended in space. He suspends the earth in space. There's nothing supporting it but his own will. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, speaking of Jesus, it says, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He keeps everything together. Hebrews 1, 3 says, the Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word, I like the phrase, the word of his power, by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high in heaven. He keeps everything together. Jesus keeps everything together. And by the way, he keeps you together too. When you think things are falling apart, he's the one who keeps you together. Never forget that. That's why you cast your cares on him. That's why you pursue him because he's the one who keeps you together too. He keeps us all together. But he stretches out the north 
over empty space. He hangs the earth, he says, on nothing. He, everything consists by the word of his power. In verse 8, he binds up the water in his thick clouds, yet the clouds are not broken under it. He creates the clouds, and you look up and you see them, and, and these are clouds that hold water. They hold water, but they don't burst. They're not like water skins. And he's just making that observation. He's saying it is done in such a way that the great weight of all of that water um, doesn't, doesn't descend. He, he keeps it together, and, and he allows that water to drop but it does so in droplets when it rains. And so he's just simply saying the power of God. In verse 9, he covers the face of his throne, spreads his cloud over it. So he uses the image of clouds in the sky to say it is not seen by those, his throne is not seen by those who are below. And so the image is intended to communicate that sinful man cannot approach God in his holiness. And that's something we see as an image throughout Scripture. For example, Psalm 18, verse 11 says, He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, the dark rain clouds of the sky. In Psalm 97, verse 2, Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. So God is holy is the point he's making. Man is sinful. And it's not possible to approach God in our own goodness because every element of the unsaved man is tainted and rotten in sin. That's what the scripture says. So God is holy, man is not. So it's not possible for us in our own righteousness to approach him. And he makes it clear in the book of Exodus, for example, chapter 33, verse 20, speaking of God, it says, he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. Moses had said, I want to see you. I want to see your glory. And God says, no. No man can look upon me and live. God is holy and man is sinful. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 through 17, Paul said, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings and lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. God is the only king of kings. He's the sovereign, but he says he dwells in unapproachable light. So God says, no one can look upon my face and live. I dwell in unapproachable light. God is holy. Man is sinful. How is it possible to approach a holy God seeing that we're sinful? You see, when you read your Bible, scriptures indicate that we can see him because in Job 19, 26 and 27, after my skin has been uh, destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. My eyes shall behold and not another. I will be seeing him, he says. And remember in Matthew 5, verse 8, uh, Je Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Now, wait a minute. No one shall look upon my face and live. I dwell in unapproachable light, and yet, blessed are those who are pure in heart, they shall see God. And Job said, I, my eyes will behold him. Okay, here's your answer. We can't physically see God. He's invisible. He dwells in unapproachable light. So physically, we can't see him. Spiritually, we can't see him because he's holy, and man is sinful. And that's what the Bible says. By nature, we are sinful. Psalm 51, verse 5, I was shapen in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 130, verse 3, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O oh Lord, who can stand? Ephesians 2, verse 3, Paul says, We are by nature children of wrath, even as others. Okay, we've got a holy God. We can't approach him in our sinfulness. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. But there's a promise that I will see him. How is that promise fulfilled? The, the solution is the incarnation and the voluntary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 
because God took upon himself human flesh and lived amongst us. And again, in Colossians 1, verse 15, it says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. So Jesus, God, took upon himself human flesh, dwelt amongst us, even as John said when we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God. And so Jesus Christ in his incarnation takes upon himself the sin of the world as the Lamb of God and becomes our mediator. That's why in John 14, verse 6, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. So as the Lamb of God, Jesus paid the penalty on our behalf, which makes it possible to be forgiven. And then he makes it possible because of our forgiveness that for us to one day see God because we've been purified, washed by the blood of Christ. In 1 John 3, 2, John said, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, this is even more powerful. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So what happens is, no, I cannot see God in my sinful flesh. But when I commit my heart to Christ and my sin is forgiven, God imputes or gives to me his own righteousness, which makes it possible for me to have fellowship with him and to see him. And that knowledge has caused me to become confident to approach him. In Hebrews 4.16, it says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So again, that's the result of the grace of God who makes fellowship possible for us. Someone once said, if sin will be the ruin of men, and surely it will, yet our Lord Jesus Christ knows how to take the ruined sinners and build them up to be temples for his indwelling. Christ will take the very castaways of the devil and use them for himself. He delights to stoop over the dunghill and pick up a broken vessel that has been thrown away and make it into a vessel fit for the master's use. Isn't that beautiful? He can take broken pottery. He can take that which has been thrown away that has no value, and he can make it fit for his own use. That's what God does. That's why I've said so many times, the only, the only uh, valuable vessel in the hand of God is the broken one. When that woman broke that alabaster vase of, that contained the fragrant ointment, she broke it and, and used it to anoint Jesus with. And, and that vase itself was nothing. It, was, it wasn't that valuable. It was the contents of the vase that was valuable. And the only way that that came out is when it was broken. And, and so we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency may be of God and not ourselves. So when people are being broken and Job is being broken, when your life is being broken, it is not broken without repair. Guys, always remember that it is broken so that you can be repaired in his image and you will have a word of comfort to give to others who are suffering through the things you yourself have gone through. And so when you learn that spiritual lesson that God's comfort is intended not just to be enjoyed by me, but to be given to others, then you'll understand how that though one suffers, the body suffers together, but we have the remedy in Christ, and we can bring that to someone and say, look, I've been broken like you? Not exactly, of course, but I've been there, and I can tell you this, you're never alone. God is with you. He will repair you, and he will use you if you just trust in him. You can say that. You can know that. Because that's what God does. And Job is going through these things. And he's being broken. As he continues, he speaks concerning the fact that, well, in verse, uh, I'll start at verse uh, 8. He binds up the water in thick clouds. The clouds are not broken under it. Covers the face of his throne. Spreads his cloud over it. In verse 10, he drew a circular horizon on the face of the waters at the boundary of light and darkness. So it's interesting how he speaks of the boundary 
of light. He speaks of a circular horizon. In other words, he formed the horizon, which is interesting. You know, once again, uh, Job was aware that the earth was round. Sorry, flat earthers. Um, in Proverbs 8.27b, it, it speaks of how he, he drew a circle on the face of the deep. There's a horizon he's aware of. The earth is a globe. He speaks of, in verse 10, uh, the boundary of light. That, that means that when it's dark in one place, it's light in another. When it's night, in other words, in one hemisphere, it's day in the other. In verse 11, he says, the pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his rebuke. Now, that, that is one of those verses that there's a lot of comment on. It may be referring to mountains, the pillars of heaven, mountains that reach to the heavens. But as it speaks uh, in that way, notice it says the pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his rebuke. So it would include the, the various storms and all that can take place on mountain tops, the lightning and the thunder. He's saying that is all under his rule. Now, it's interesting that they are astonished, it says, at his rebuke. Uh, again, that could be a picture of the mountains under the rule of God. In verse 12, he says, he stirs up the sea with his power and by his understanding breaks up the storm. Even nature itself obeys him. He stirs up the sea, but he also calms it. He breaks up, it says, he breaks up the storm. He can calm the proud waves of the ocean. The psalmist in Psalm 65, verses 5 through 7, said it like this. He said, by awesome deeds, you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, the one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. Psalm 89, 8 and 9 says, O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. And he says, you rule the raging of the sea when its waves rise, you still them. So that caused me, as I was preparing the study, that caused me to remember something that I had, had read uh, in the past uh, concerning the fact that Jesus Christ can still the storm. And I, I was thinking of that. I was thinking of the time that Jesus and his men were in a storm on the Sea of Galilee. We are all familiar with this story. A, a great storm arose. The boat was covered, the Bible says, with waves. But Jesus was asleep. And the disciples were afraid, and they woke him up, and they said, Lord, save us. We're perishing. Well, Matthew tells us that Jesus spoke and said, Why are you so fearful, O you of little faith? And then he arose, and he rebuked the winds. He spoke to him, and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the scripture in Matthew 8, verse 27 says, The men marveled, saying, who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Yeah, I guess so. I've been on the Sea of Galilee many times, many times. And there have been times when it was a little, um, there was a little bit of a storm, not, not a major one, nothing as large as the ones we see in Scripture. But there have been times in that the boat that we're in begins to lift a little bit and all. And we always get the same thing, our... our um, the guys who own the boats and all of that, and they always say, that anybody here want to take a walk? You know, uh, one time I was with Raul Reese, and he tried. We found him at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. Who wants to take a walk? Well, obviously, that's the whole point, you know. And so when you think of the fact that God is the one who steals the storm, it's interesting how Jesus had to still the storm in the hearts of his men before he stilled the storm on the ocean. Which do you think was more difficult? He has quicker response from nature than he does from his own people. He has, you see that so often in Scripture where he has to still us before he stills nature itself. And so he has that power. And what do they do? 
they began to say, who is this? Who is this? We have yet to come to realize that we actually have God in the flesh in this boat with us. And when you understand that no matter where you are, you're never alone, you actually grow in your confidence and your strength. If you can wake up in the morning, even as you put your head on your pillow at night, and you can remind yourself, I am not alone. He is with me. He never leaves me. He never forsakes me. I'm never by myself. Even how the Lord Jesus was praying and said to his father, and now I'm alone, and yet I'm not alone, for you are with me. If we would only understand that, if we only knew that. See, the world doesn't know that. The world can't say that, but the church can. The church can. You know, I'm, I'm not presumptuous. It can sound like I am. I'm not one who, who tempts the Lord. I'm not going to stand at the pinnacle of the temple and jump off just to see if the angels of God will lift me up because they're not going to, and I just get to heaven quicker. You know, that's, that's not the way to do it. But at the same time, like you, well, it's like this. If the word of God says he's with me, he will strengthen me. He never leaves me, that he'll give me power, that I can have confidence. He didn't give me a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and sound mind. If those things are true, and they are, then maybe I ought to live as if I believe that. That doesn't mean I tempt him. That doesn't mean I go stand in the middle of a street and see whether a car can kill me when it hits me. It doesn't mean I'm going to do that or presume on him. It simply means I can live in peace, that I know that God is in control and he's moving on his own timetable. And I can know that because God can still the storm of the sea. I ask him to still the storm within me. God, because I want to rest and, and I, want to, I want to be. Jesus, you were asleep. You weren't afraid of anything. You know you were going to make it through and you knew the men were too. And here they are saying we're about to perish when in fact that wasn't possible. You were with them. And if we only understood that, I'm not saying again, to, to go out and tempt the Lord. I'm simply saying, let's walk in confidence because he's with us. You see, nature itself obeys God is the point that he's making. He stirs up the sea with his power. By his understanding, breaks up the storm. Verse 13, by his spirit, he adorned the heavens. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. Interesting. When it says, by his spirit, he adorned the heavens, by his spirit would refer, of course, to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who was part of the creation of the world. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it says, the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. By his spirit, he adorned the heavens. The spirit is part of his initial creation. He says, he adorned the heavens. He made the heavens beautiful. Wonderful to behold and humbling to man. Indeed, the heavens are humbling to man because God has done this beautiful work. He has done this, and he has made these things beautiful. And so when we go outside and we see what is taking place, how the Lord has created all things, I don't know about you. My wife, Marie, and I sometimes, um, especially after it's rained, but there are times when we're driving together, and my, my girl will look at me, and she'll say this, and, and we say it fairly often. She'll say, isn't it beautiful? Isn't, isn't, isn't it beautiful? What a beautiful morning. It's so beautiful. And we know who to thank for that. It's God himself. In Psalm 8, verse 1, it reads, O Lord, our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. In verse 3 of Psalm 8, he said, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, you have set in their place. What is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man, human beings, that you visit or you care for them? So, God, you've made everything beautiful. But it's interesting in verse 13 how he says his hand has pierced the fleeing serpent. That's an interesting phrase there. And as I was preparing, I, I looked at various commentators, which I do when I'm, when I'm studying the Bible. And the commentators I use are not united in their understanding of what Job would be saying when it says his hand pierced the fleeing serpent. So some think he's referring simply to actual serpents, serpents of any kind. And one commentator went so far as to say he may be speaking of a crocodile. 
And so they're saying that he's speaking concerning the ones whom he has created, and they interpret the word pierced to mean the one he formed. So he, they're saying, well, he's, he's speaking of serpents of any kind. But others look at the, the word pierced, and they say it speaks of something that is crooked. So they'd say that this is speaking of lightning. And lightning, when it comes, the crooked serpent, they would say, beautifies the skies. There's others who say this speaks of the serpent, the great dragon, Satan himself. Remember in Revelation 12, verse 9, how the scripture says the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So the crooked serpent, Satan. Satan was part of God's original creation and he fell through pride. Well, Job, knowing of the fall of man, would be saying, that Satan initiated that fall, which he did. And as a response, God will bring judgment on the great dragon for his rebellion. That would indicate that Job was aware Satan would be judged. And uh, we know that Satan will ultimately, ultimately be thrown into the lake of uh, burning sulfur with the Antichrist and false prophet. So in Job's presentation of God's power over creation, this reveals its totality. The punishing of the serpent is evidence over God's power, of God's power over the author of evil. Now, we'll close with a couple of thoughts. Remember, Bildad had said dominion and fear belong to him in verse 2 of chapter 25. Well, here Job makes it clear that that is something he knows absolutely to be true. And so he closes in verse 14 by saying, indeed, these are the mere edges of his ways. And how small a whisper we hear of him, but the thunder of his power, who can understand? I've spoken of his grandeur, but now I speak that he is an incredibly awesome God. We can't understand the depth of his glory. We can't understand the magnitude of his majesty. All we can do is hear the whisper, but we can't endure the full thunder of glory. So Bildad, he is the absolute king over the entire universe. He is terrible in might, and all men should seek peace with him. He's saying God is perfect, and we're not. Yes, Bildad, we're only worms and maggots, and in the end, we need help. And we know in the New Testament that that help came to us through Jesus Christ. You see, Bildad is not aware of the love of God. He's aware of his awesome power, but he doesn't know his saving mercy yet. You see, it's God's loving grace that produces changed lives, not some rigid form of legalism, a list of don't do these things. It's the grace of God that actually brings life because the letter of the law is what kills. And God's grace and God's mercy have been revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. And that's why we can confess our sin because he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when we give our heart to Christ, we, we, can, we can know God in a deeper way we could actually begin to hear more than simply a whisper of his grandeur and majesty. But one day we shall see him face to face. And one day we will hear his voice as it speaks to us in an audible form. And one day we will be able to, to worship him with all of the saints, and all of the ages and thunderous worship and praise where we will say, you are worthy, O God, to receive honor and glory for you have created all things and by you all things have been created and exist. And Lord, we love you and we give to you glory because you revealed yourself to us through Jesus Christ. Bill, Dad, you don't know that aspect of God, but we have been given the privilege of being able to see that in the face of Jesus Christ. And in that, we ought to be very, very, very grateful because he has shown us his love through his son. And Father, we ask, that you would work within us, Lord, so that we would really appreciate that simple knowledge, 
that our sins are forgiven, that you are awesome in majesty and powerful in might. And yet, Lord, you took upon yourself you in flesh. You, you dwelled amongst us. And, and people were able to see you in Jesus Christ. Like you said to Philip, have I been so long a time with you and yet you have not known me, Philip? You who has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Well, Jesus, you revealed yourself to your men. and By your spirit, you have revealed yourself to us. And so we would honor you and we would worship you and we would follow you. For God, you are worthy of all honor and glory. And we love you. And even as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, perhaps there are some right now, whether watching online or in this room, we need prayer. You need to get right with God. Obviously, I can't see those who are online, but I can see those in this room. And if you need prayer, and perhaps those of you who are online, you might want to join in this. If you need prayer, you want to be right with the Lord, would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you right where you're at. Father, you see these hands. You know the reason why they're being raised to you. And in Jesus' name, I ask that you would reach and touch them right now. Their hands are raised to you saying, God, be merciful to me and help me. I need you. Perhaps some are opening their hearts and saying, God, I need you to dwell within me. I want to follow you. Perhaps there are some even right now on, online who are doing that. Father, I pray that you would work within them. And right now, you would make yourself known to them. May they have your peace. And may they have your comfort. And may they walk from this point on in your spirit. We yield ourselves to you. And we receive from you right now. And we thank you. And we bless you. Thank you, Lord. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, I pray that you would work with all of us. And I pray this in your name. Amen.